Good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. I want to thank you all for coming. Um, we have two special students on plan, Jeremiah Nelson. Uh, they've been working on a couple of research projects who have, and those projects have come to a culmination or completion during this past fall, and we're here to present the outcome of that study. They are two entirely different research projects. Uh, there is a little bit of educational as well as entertainment value in these, and again, we thank you for coming. I want to introduce the first one, which is uh, our study that we call Animal Spirits and the Groundhog Effect Upon Stock Prices. And this is a unique study. Researchers from throughout the world and multi-disciplines have been pondering a very significant question. Everybody has been concerned from, uh, from biologic uh, or biology-based science to others. And that big question is, what do you get when you cross a bear and a groundhog? And we're going to tell you today. If you're not familiar with the nomenclature or symbols used in the stock market, a bear is a symbol of a declining stock market because they tend to run with their nose down and their butt up in a downward fashion. A bull is a symbol of an upward rising stock market because the bull is always snorting and raising his head. It's a bit of stock market history. So I hope you enjoy the study and at the end we'll uh, make some closing comments. Thank you for coming. Thank you, Mr. Fazio. Um, and I would like to also tell those who are at Phi Beta Lambda, uh, the business organization, business club, and for anybody that's not familiar with it, it's one of the largest uh, student business organizations in the world. But we generally meet here in this room at 11 and 5 on Thursday. So if anybody's interested, we encourage you to come on out and check us out. For those who are at Phi Beta Lambda and are attending for that meeting, we'll have a sign-up sheet down here at the end of the presentation. Um, as you all know, last, I think it was, yeah, last, sorry, last Friday, yeah, two Fridays ago, we had the uh, Groundhog Day breakfast, I had to get my dates correct, yeah, two Fridays ago we had the uh, Groundhog Day breakfast and uh, we presented this study there as well and this is the correlation between the Groundhog Day and the effects that it has on the S&P 500, um, which was kind of interesting, you know, if the Groundhog sees a shadow, um, then we get six more weeks of winter, which would uh, interpret into a bad stock market and uh, whether it didn't see his shadow and it was cloudy outside and we have uh, a great, uh, you know, the spring comes early and that would be in an increased stock market. Um, this year's presenter or the, um, or the grand, grand Groundhog Watcher was Lou Stoker. She's the mayor of Branwell. She's a historian, an actor, a writer, a number of different things. Very talented lady. I wish there had been a few more people there that could have uh, had the opportunity to hear her presentation. Um, the presentation we have today is Animal Spirits and the Groundhog Effect, Assessing the Impact Upon Stock Prices. <clears throat> this quote here, John M. Keynes is a uh, baron. He's one of, famous, uh, one of the famous British economists. Um, his quote here, even apart from the instability due to speculation, there is the instability due to characteristics of human nature that a large proportion of our positive activities depend on spontaneous optimism rather than mathematical expectations, whether moral, hedonistic, or economic, most probably of our decisions to have something to do have have to do something positive the full consequences of which will be drawn out over many days to come can only be taken as a result of animal spirits and that is it's a spontaneous urge of action rather than inaction not as the outcome of a weighted average of quantitative benefits multiplied by quantitative probabilities that's kind of like when you decide to do something and it's not necessarily something that you sat down and worked out a mathematical formula and what you wanted to do it's that animal spirit in you that drives you to do that <laughs> study outline here we're going to introduce the uh, the topic uh, purpose of the study the method methodology our hypotheses uh, the conclusion discussion and of course our references here um, as you all know stock performances and behavioral finance uh, recognize or some of you may not know um, theoretically valid uh, theories out there two of these things are calendar events and weather calendar events such as Christmas we know that when Christmas is around people are going to be going out spending lots of money um, weather can be something like good weather if there's good weather we're going to be going to the beach we're going to be traveling we're going to be going places and for those of us like myself who like to ski or snowboard that might be in the winter it's snowing a lot we might go skiing or snowboarding but 
a little different. Um, the purpose of this study is to explore the relationship between the result of Groundhog Day and the performance of the Standard & Poor's 500 stock index over the next six week period following Groundhog Day. And now I'll turn this over here to Tron and she will cover our next area, the methodology. For this study, um, we have the two variables. The first one is the dependent variable will be the six week performance of the Standard & Poor 500 stock index. And the independent variable will be the performance of Pansotonil field and for this study, we use a two-tail t-test by the NCSS software. And we have two hypotheses. The first one is there is a significant difference in the performance of bunk sotonyl fill uh, on Groundhog Day and the subsequent six-week performance on of the standard and poor 500 stock index. And the second hypothesis is there is no difference in the performance of pound sweat you feel on the Groundhog Day and the subsequent six week performance of the S&P 500 stock index. And as you can see in this uh, graph, this is the result of this study and it's from the 40 year average of the return standard and poor 500. Um, when we have the good weather, it means didn't see the shadow. Um, the average will be up to 4.22% and for the bad weather, it means uh, Bansutin Phil saw his shadow, it's going to be down around 4.03%. And the results are supportive for the H1, like the first hypothesis, that there is a significant difference in the standard and poor performance for the six week period when Bong Sutton Phil did see his shadow and when he did not see his shadow. And then we return to Mr. Fazio to closing this, the first presentation. Thank you, thank you. Um, Four percent either way is really significant. The average annual return for the stock market is about 12 percent for history. I'm so nervous. And this is quite unusual to our knowledge. This is the first time such a link has been done. Now, I can appreciate the fact that you might think this is a little bit of a, uh, let's say, quirky or unusual study. Um, I have to agree with you, it really is. But sometimes to get out on the edge and extend yourself a little bit is where you discover new things. But we're not totally on our own with this study. And in a library and in my office is this book, it's titled Animal Spirits, How Human Psychology Drives the Economy and Why It Matters for Global Capitalism. Investing is a lot about emotions. And Jeremiah mentioned behavioral finance. This book is written by two significant scholars. Robert Schiller on the faculty of Yale, he's a worldwide known economist, and his other gentleman, also a PhD, I am very envious of. His name is George Ackerloff. And years ago, pursuing his PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, he wrote a 13-page dissertation. 13-page <laughs> dissertation. And that's where I'm very envious of. <laughs> and he won the Nobel Prize for his work. If anybody might be interested in copies of either of these, the uh, Nobel Prize winning dissertation paper all will be happy to give it to you. So we're hoping to continue this study. There are certain limitations. Uh, if you're familiar with the stock market, there's a so-called January effect. If the stock market has a good first five days in January, the whole month tends to be good. And that may influence the results you see because Groundhog Day is the first of February and the six weeks that follow may be influenced by that. There's other events that we need to take a look at. So there's work that needs to be done. Uh, we need to extend it beyond our current sample, which is 30 years of the Standard Poor's 500, and explore other indices as well. And we're in the process of doing that in the hope that we can, at some point in time, get a broader study and ultimately get it published in some financial publication. Now the second work, may I go ahead with the introductions? Sure, I'll, sure. I'll switch over that. The second piece pertains to many of the things we actually do teach in our classroom, management, organizational theory, and leadership. Uh, we did a study of high-ranked education institutions. Uh, U.S. News and World Report every year lists the 100 best colleges and universities. 
and then the Chronicle Higher Education lists the 100 best to work for. And we, mostly Jeremiah Hahn, I should qualify that for you, went through and studied mission statements, strategic plans, vision statements for the 100 in each of those respective publications, plus 100 in a random sample. So you take 300 times 3, 900 statements. We were busy in the fall. We were busy. And I'm going to let our two students give you the outcome of that study. Thanks again. Get the clicker. My <laughs> <laughs> Right. And not to go uh, too far into a um, uh, strategic management class or anything like that, but if anybody here is familiar with the resource-based view, um, that has to do with the four areas of, uh, of, an, uh, of an organization or a business uh, that make it special. That's the, uh, that's the rarity of what they do, the value of which they add uh, to their product, products, or service, um, that that is, it's not imitatable and it's unsubstitutable. Up to the excuse me, unsubstitutable. I was worried I was going to have problems with in, in unimitatable. So, <laughs> but uh, also there has a lot to do with the organizational culture of uh, those businesses. And one of my um, uh, this is a quote by Lake Wobegon. Um, this is a connecting theory of practice. It's a simple trick, but when it occurs, it can tri tri trigger dazzling insights. Um, one of my favorite quotes that I've heard somebody say, and I'm not for sure exactly who the one uh, is that said it, but it says, a happy employee makes for a happy customer. It's like if you go into a place and you're, regardless whether it's in a restaurant or um, you're talking to someone on the phone, if that person sounds happy or they sound like they really enjoy working and they're there to help you, it makes that experience that much more better for the for the customer. And of course, in, uh, in this study here between employees and the customers would be more or less between uh, say staff and faculty and the students who are the customers or the, or the, the consumers. Uh, this, uh, this talks about the execution gap, the uh, execution gap between uh, strategy formulation and the execution in many organizations. Um, a poignant explanation for this is the failure to appreciate people in the organization as their most important asset, and it is. I mean, it's, if you think about it, it's uh, a lot of people out there, they have a, a mindset sometimes, or if not familiar uh, with this, these type of studies, they might think that organizations or businesses are supposed to be run a particular set of ways, um, saying, is, I'm the boss, you're supposed to listen to me. It's not necessarily that way, and I'm sure some of y'all have covered that in Management 305 with uh, Mr. Fazio. Um, higher educations are probably one of the best examples of this execution gap. <coughs> And in this quote, Allen of 2003 observed that the higher education institutions are attempting to adapt to change. It is with increased strategic planning and an unquestioning confidence in a specific management style. Again, that specific management style may be the type that's top down, where they're saying, you do as I say, and you listen to me. If I mess up, it's okay. You just do what I tell you to. Um, <laughs> one promising construct for closing this execution gap in higher education is, of course, people. And I'll turn this over to Han now to explain the purpose of the study. With all the information Jeremiah just gave to you guys about the execution gap and the resource bay view, our study is designed to extend the theoretical framework of the strategy to higher education to maximize the misalignment between the strategy formulation and execution. This study integrates an organizational emphasis on people with a resource-based view of strategy, and it is assumed that an explicit and communicable emphasis on people will mediate the gap between the strategic formulation and implementation, and thereby will improve the performance and employee satisfaction in higher education. For this study, um, the research question is what are the differences in the performance and employee satisfaction between the higher education emphasized people in their vision statement, mission statement, and the strategic plan versus the higher education institutions that do not emphasize people. And then Zeremiah will talk with you about the variable and the test with you for this study. <laughs> Our de dependent variables here, uh, we took a, a listing of the top 100 institutions in the U.S. News and World Report, World Report uh, the 100 best colleges, and also the Chronicle of Higher Education's 
uh, 100 greatest colleges. <coughs> the independent variables here are the random sample of 100 higher education institutions extracted from University of Texas um, database. And these are my references here if you'd like to check those out to verify. Um, the statistical measurements of these were uh, utilized using a chi-square analysis um, using SPSS software. We came up with two hypotheses here. Higher education institutions that emphasize people within their vision statement, mission statement, and strategic plan will have a significantly different performance ranking than higher education organizations that do not emphasize people in their vision statement, mission statement, and strategic plan. And these notes look kind of similar to the same. Um, again, this over here, just a slight bit different, that emphasizes people in their vision statement, mission statement, and strategic plan will have significantly different employee satisfaction levels than higher education institutions that do not emphasize people in their mission statement, mission statement, or strategic plan. And the results will be explained here by Han. As you can see in this table, for the best college, almost 80% of their vision statement, mission statement, and strategic plan emphasize people in it. But for the 100 random sample, only around like 55% emphasize people in any of those statements. And the results support for both hypotheses in the chi-square chi test, less than 0.05 is significant. And for both of the two tests, the first one we got 0.046, and the second one <coughs> is the 0.2. And it's made that like people make a difference in organizational success those organizations that visibly and emphatically support the employee and the human capital are enjoying more positive outcome and thus when differentiates this organization from other competitors. And then the finding of this study suggests that an emphasis on people will improve both execution and employee commitment in the higher education because employee will feel that the organization value their contribution. And Mr. Fado when closing this presentation. Thank you. Yes. Mm. Uh, for discussion, we would like you to think of our living laboratory, Concord University. And uh, here at Concord, we finished 38th in the Southeast among colleges and universities in the U.S. News and World Report. A lot of schools in the Southeast. 38 is really quite good. But then if you study a little bit deeper, there are like five schools in our immediate target market, Wesleyan, Alderson, Brocks, and those that are ahead of us. We firmly believe, we would passionately like to see a little bit more emphasis on people. Uh, Concord is working on its strategic plan now and attempting to revise it and update it it's not very costly to make statements about the value of the employees in these mission statements. And that's a little bit of an outcome from our study. Um, we are also in discussion with people that are affiliated with the Chronicle of Higher Education about maybe giving us a little bit of exposure there. And for Han and Jeremiah's excellent work, I hope that happens. Here are some limitations from the study. Uh, when you go through and you look at all these statements, there is the issue, a limitation, by the way, is a shortcoming or something that needs to be brought out or addressed. And there's a lot of subjectivity because we have to extract the existence of people. Um, there's also the likelihood of confounding variables or something else that's influencing the outcome. So that requires further study. So there's a lot of work here that we could be involved in for the foreseeable future. <coughs> And we would certainly love to have some student involvement with that. So please keep that in mind. There you see the recommendation. Work leads the field of higher education strategies and knowledge gain. There are more to be pursued. Uh, we want to explore other variables and maybe link to this as well, such as faculty turnover and student retention. Be interesting to see the emphasis on people has some causal relationship between those as dependent variables. You really do. <laughs> There's some references. 
That's a question. Thanks. <laughs> Any questions? Thanks. I want to use this as a backdrop. Uh, this is a quote from Victor Hugo, and maybe you saw the movie by mm -hmm. Zdravos lately. Bless me so cool. But think about this. Uh, this, to my knowledge, did not appear in the book or the movie, but it's a compelling quote. I have some social networking friends, one of which, her name is Kyla LaPierre. She's the international operations manager for State Street Bank. International operations manager. They're all over the world. We posted some of these studies on our social networking sites. Kyla calls me, she says, have Han Tran send me her resume. <laughs> Pretty powerful, isn't it? I also have a social networking friend, and uh, her name is Pam Ferris. She's executive director of Leadership for West Virginia. Several hundred top executives from private and public sectors throughout West Virginia meet and learn leadership skills. They want to hear Jeremiah Nelson come to a meeting and present his presentation, you may have been to that, on a authentic leadership. Bring a lot of resumes. All right. <laughs> The reason this quote is behind you, behind me, in front of you, excuse me, just take a look at it and analyze it. Use those wings you have. It's all in all of you. You have to be engaged in a classroom, and you have to extend yourself and do things beyond the classroom. We would never got those contacts if Jeremiah and Han didn't do things beyond the classroom. Thank you very much for the opportunity today.